Masoud for inviting me to speak here today. Great pleasure. So I'll try to be brief and give um, an overview of my work in 10 minutes, which pretty much can be summarized in this <laughs> diagram, in which actually is, uh, the purpose of it is twofold. In one, so looking at this like decoding and encoding back into the brain uh, refers to the, the interest pretty much in prosthetics, building devices that uh, decode information from the brain and can send information back so that we can enact voluntary motor activity, for example. On the other hand, um, the other purpose of this diagram is to perhaps um, try to convince you that this is a good paradigm to try also to understand brain function, in particular uh, adaptation. And I hope in the discussion we can talk more about this. Getting a little bit more into details, um, this block diagram from Miguel Nicolelis, where I did my doctoral work with, shows all these components that uh, Dr. Suarez was mentioning, or some of them before, that takes part, in this case, in BMIs. And you ca we can see from the uh, perspective of uh, microwires implanted in different brain areas, wireless telemetry to send information elsewhere, uh, data processing, in this case, uh, approximators of, of neural activity to behavior, motor commands that drive a robotic arm, like in this case, and then a very important part, which is closing the loop, um, in this case, you see here visual and tactile feedback. Uh, the work you are going to see, or the results you are going to see today, uh, they are all based on visual feedback, but tactile, uh, perhaps proprioceptive. Um, it's a very important uh, uh, line of uh, research that these days almost all uh, groups doing invasive BMI work are actually pursuing, which is can we send information to the brain uh, about other sensor modalities besides vision, like uh, what the gripper of the robotic arm is grasping, for example, where the position of the limb is in space, and so on. All right. So, oops, yeah. Uh, in terms of the techniques that we use, um, I'll try to summarize everything in this slide. Okay, so um, our recordings are using this uh, multi-electrode microwire array. Uh, this is actually developed at the university. I uh, will not go into details about the materials or configuration. It's very versatile. You could basically arrange in a group of 16, 32, 64 microwires like this one. This gets into the cortex, uh, hopefully in layer five. And these are the areas that we are, or we did, target in two macaque monkeys uh, from frontoparietal cortices, in particular dorsal premotor cortex, uh, supplementary motor area, primary motor cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, and in one case, uh, MIP in posterior parietal cortex. And what you see here is an example of, in this case, uh, an animal that we had with the largest number of these electrodes of uh, hundreds of neurons simultaneously recorded in motor cortex across several uh, cortical areas. And here you see a zoom in of one of these guys. Um, with normal amplitudes around 100 to 150 microvolts, peak to peak. So, okay, this is uh, the technique. Other groups use similar approaches with floating electrodes, so on and so on. Uh, the idea being having a closed loop paradigm in which macaque monkey can, uh, in this case, perform cer certain behavioral tasks. And in this case, uh, we have uh, three tasks here. I'm going to show data and videos from the first one, which is a reaching task. So basically, this animal has to reach, controlling the, uh, for these targets, moving this joystick. So it's controlling this little cursor here, and the target shows up randomly in different positions in every trial and gets a use reward for that. While at the same time, we're recording the activity from all these, uh, in this case, 150 to 200 neurons simultaneously, and we're applying very basic multidimensional linear regression, as you see here, uh, looking at one second into the past in every time measurement that we take. Okay, so, and this is, there are several reasons about this. Among them, uh, all the information that is contained in the planning and the downstream propagation of motor activity uh, before the actual uh, movement takes place. So, let me show you how one of the animals performed uh, the first task. So, this is what we call, uh, in the first part of the experiment, manual control. The animal is uh, just focused on and basically getting as many targets as he can get. Uh, per minute, and um, at the same time, uh, you see an infrared marker there. We are uh, recording. Sorry, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So at the same time, as I say, we are collecting this data and we are um, regressing the neural activity to the behavior and visualizing how well our predictions are. 
Uh, after about 10 minutes of data, uh, our model generalized pretty well, and we decided that that's enough, uh, and we freeze th that last model. And before jumping to what we call brain control, let me show you these are records of uh, basically predictions of this uh, li linear model. You have in blue uh, one, sec one minute sorry, of data uh, of the observed position of velocity or even gripping force of one of these animals, and in red, the predictions from the model. This is one of the best sessions. The predictions are very good. But basically what this is uh, demonstrating here is what Georgiopoulos and many others have shown during many years, uh, that there is uh, information about direction of movement in motor cortex and so on. Here, if we record at the same time enough neurons, we can actually predict movement in whole X and Y space. Okay. Uh, if we look um, at the um, information content, or in this case, a uh, correlation coefficient of each of these individual neurons for these motor, uh, different motor parameters like position, velocity, or gripping force, across all cortical areas here, color-coded, what we see is that information is spread all over cortex. Uh, every cortical area has contributions for all parameters. The uh, primary motor cortex, as expected, is the one with the highest contributors, but there is also very high uh, correlation in other areas. Not only that, uh, same neurons correlate very highly with multiple parameters simultaneously. If we now group this uh, per cortical area, so each curve here shows all the neurons from one area, like in red is M1, dark, I mean black is SMA, and so on. What we see is the accuracy of prediction of the model as a function of number of neurons. So the more neurons we add to the ensemble, the higher the prediction gets. And we also see how different parameters, like position, velocity, and gripping force, are, are encoded uh, differently in different cortical areas. So another message to take here is that uh, information is spread all over cortex. So one of the amazing uh, aspects of this technique is that, uh, well, not the technique, sorry, but the fact that information is spread all over cortex is that uh, wherever you put your microwire array in motor cortex, you get correlation with all motor parameters. So uh, obviously you, you have to be in your hand representation area or your arm or whatever you, you, you want to target, but after that you don't need more resolution than that to target cells that are going to basically um, have directional tuning properties. Uh, not only motor cortex, as I just mentioned, but all over areas. So then, uh, once we had a model that was trained, as we, after 10 minutes of data, uh, we switched to what we call brain control, which basically disconnects the joystick. So even though the animal, as you will see, will be moving the arm, the predictions uh, come, I mean, the, the control of the cursor comes directly from the brain of the monkey through the linear model, which generates predictions. And uh, you will see it. So you can see that the, the, the movement is very intentional. The animal does very well. Uh, the percentage of trials correct is slightly lower than uh, in, a, in the case of manual control. But obviously, you see that the animal is moving the arms, so you might think, like, well, that's cheating because proprioceptive feedback obviously is going to help the model to do better. And in fact, that's uh, the case. As we, uh, what, what happened here is that eventually the animals uh, quit moving the arm, so we remove the joystick. Uh, and this is what we, we show here. The arm is, of the animal is just resting in the plate. There's no joystick and the animal keeps performing the task. And you can notice a difference in perhaps the speed of the cursor versus brain control with our movement and the fact that the animal struggles a little bit more in some cases to hit the target. And indeed, that's, in my opinion, uh, the key factor there is the, the fact that there is no proprioceptive feedback. It's purely visual feedback and the animal enacting volitional neuroactivity to control the, the cursor. So, more, I mean, just to try to give you um, the summary of all the results that, of this study, what we saw is consistently the two animals, there was improvement both uh, in, um, in behavioral <laughs> training, on manual control, which is blue, and brain control, which is red, across sessions, okay? and also decrease in time to hit each target in both modes of operation for both animals. That's the first task. In the third task, which I don't have time to show videos, but uh, I will be happy to do so after. Um, this is a reach and grasp task. The animals have to reach in the target and then squeeze the joystick and make the cursor grow to a certain diameter to match a given cue. Uh, basically analogous as to reaching and grasping for a given object uh, of different size or different weight. Um, in brain control, you can see the performance drops significantly with respect to the reaching task only. It's still doing, in this case, 75% trials correct, but this is already addressing an important, perhaps, bottleneck in this technique, 
of, or in this field of how far can we go, the harder we make the task, the more degree of freedom that we add, how, how difficult it's going to be or how possible it's going to be just with visual feedback for the animals to, to solve this problem. Okay. Um, looking at uh, perhaps the most interesting, one of the most interesting parts from the neuroscience perspective is what happens in this, in this population of neurons okay. uh, during comparing manual control and brain control. And so let's just pay attention to this plot here. In the vertical axis, we have uh, directional tuning or the tuning depth, which is the metric that we use in this case for all the neurons, which is, are all these color dots for cortical areas. In a, a, while they, the animal performs in manual control, plot against when the animal is performing in brain control with no arm movement. And you can see that all the dots are in this side of the diagonal, except for a few, I mean, suggesting that indeed the directional tuning of many cells in the population shuts down in brain control with no arm movement. But still, there is a fraction of the population, about close to 20%, that has actually higher directional tuning in brain control than in pole control, uh, suggesting that these are actually the guys uh, doing the job in brain control. Um, as further directions uh, here at Berkeley um, in the lab, we are, as I mentioned, looking forward to um, understanding the principles of how can we encode information back into the brain by intracortical microstimulation. We're talking about touch, proprioception, and so on. And we're also using rat models for that. And at the same time, thinking of paradigms that might give us a better um, predictive power or better control, if you like, from the point of view of the prosthetic device by doing a shared control paradigm of a robotic component compared to, co combined to the neural signal to get a better performance. And uh, the way I will leave this is with, I mean, with this uh, illustration of this cartoon from one review paper from Nicolelis recently, that if we take this as the long-term goal, perhaps possible to reach this level of dexterity, but if this is what we are aiming at, and uh, again, another cartoon, a way to look at the uh, perhaps two main variables here. One will be uh, the level of neural control, and the other one will be how much robot control or AI we add to the system. And in this case, maximum neural control will mean uh, having perfect planning and execution, position, velocity, impedance, posture, all these um, important commands finishing. And um, in the case of robot control, we could think of a prosthetic house as a case in which every object in the house is, uh, is, is labeled so the system knows exactly how much this weights and the diameter and the shape and so on. And perhaps somewhere in between, which we don't know yet, and we don't even know if this is linear anyway, it will be an optimal compromise of how much we really need to decode from the brain and perhaps encode back to get a proficient performance. Let me just acknowledge um, the people involved in this work at Duke, uh, the PI Miguel Nicolelis, and collaborators Craig Henriquez, Michel Lebedev, and other grad students. We were funded, I was funded by Christopher Reeve, and Nicolelis was funded by DARPA. And here, this is the happy people in the lab, Berkeley, that they're doing the job these days. Thank you very much.